the the Suvaro image uh, to my right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. you're correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go. Okay, so I'm gonna let uh, I'm gonna mute. So are we in the air? <laughs> Hello, everybody. I. I am Hafthor Inquason. I'm the director of the Western Gallery and the Sculpture Collection at the Western World Central University. And I'm thrilled to uh, introduce the two speakers here, uh, or uh, a dialogue between two artists, Ed Durio and Norris Bennett. Uh, we actually thought of getting them together for a while, and finally it happened. Uh, we had an exhibition of Norris Bennett's work a year ago, starting a year ago. And uh, we uh, had scheduled quite a program, but then we had a snowstorm. So, you know, uh, knowledge was up here from, from LA. And then we, we uh, tried again, we scheduled another program day or, or, or days, and we had the pandemic. So, but here we are finally. Uh, Many of you uh, who are in this area, we never know who is, where people are from when we're going this way, um, have had an opportunity to see the work of Ed and Acknowledge uh, quite in depth because they have had both retrospectives, retrospective exhibitions or, or, or uh, big overview exhibitions. Uh, Ed Burrell had an exhibition at the Vodkam Art Museum curated by Amy Chalupka. That uh, was uh, the fall of 2019 from September to, through January 5. And then uh, Knowledge's exhibition started right after that on January 15th and was gonna be until May 2nd, but uh, we had to close down because of the pandemic. Uh, I, I have a few photographs of their work. Uh, of course, they, they are quite available online because, let me see how it is here. So, uh, so uh, Ed Burial's exhibition at the Vodkam Art Museum at the Light Catcher was called Ed Burial for, Wanted Ed Burial for Disturbing the Peace. And it really uh, covered his whole career with a beautiful catalog, uh, really, really nicely uh, illustrated and good essays. And we had uh, work from all of, all, all of his different periods as an artist. Uh, th th this is a work that uh, he had started in, in um, year 2000 and completed in 2015, these large installations. This one is called Miss America uh, Manufacturing Consent, ups and, upside down and backwards. And another installation that he just completed before the opening of the exhibition called The Birthing of the American Middle Class. No, 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 no. That is not the name of that one. That's another one. This is called Exxon, The Five Horsemen of the Apocalypse. This is the birthing of American Middle Class from 1999. Uh, Here is a work that uh, I hope we will talk about a little bit later called Miss America Presents Domestic Terrorism from 2015, dealing with um, brutal police killings of unarmed black men in New York and actually several and other cities including Baltimore, where Freddie Gray had recently been killed. Um, so we will come to this again. And 
I, I, I think that we, we might also talk about not exactly this painting, but if you just look carefully at it and, and uh, you know, the painting style and, and uh, abstraction here, that's, that's, I think, very interesting. Uh, Norris Bennett's exhibition is called The Road to Damascus. Uh, and I hope he will tell us about the title. It was an exhibition, again, that, that uh, was a retrospective, uh, basically uh, selecting, though, you know, uh, not from when he was in high school or something like that, but, but work that he was is happy with as showing his professional career, starting out very much uh, going back to the pop art. And uh, here you see, actually, uh, some works from our, our collection by Andy Warhol. And, you know, to go along with this painting that uh, uh, is called Mao Trump. This was before Trump was elected. And uh, this again, going back to, to Warhol. And another series of paintings called uh, The Orange is New Black, which is a very, very strong uh, social criticism addressing uh, basically uh, 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 organized actions by the government against the African-American community. Uh, tough work to deal with, uh, but really amazing. And this painting, he, or the, I call it paintings, is, these are uh, lithographs, I think, uh, or paintings, painting on them. Uh, and this one is called. Does that look like paintings? This is called um, License to Kill. And this, again, is dealing with police violence. This is from 2016. And uh, addressing uh, some of the most inf in infamous documented cases of police brutality in, in the city of New York. Uh, including Sean Bell, Eric Garner, Amadou Diallo, and Abner Louima. I'm sorry for the pronunciations. Uh, kind of reminder to us that uh, this has been going on for a long time. This, you know, there may be uh, uh, very publicized cases now and publicized for good reasons, but this has been going on for a long time. And then uh, third series, which is the most recent one of the what of what knowledge showed is are the black paintings, uh, and uh, here you, you to the left, furthest to the left, you see uh, actually a work by Richard Serra from our collection, which uh, uh, knowledge uh, he knows our collection very well, and 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 that's just included because he felt certain kinship there. But these these are works. Uh, Completely abstract, but uh, I think our guests responded more strongly to these works than uh, many of the other ones. You know, it, it, these were really, uh, they found certain emotional depth in them and, and hope. So um, uh, I think this is the last. But uh, both of the artists are very well represented on, on the internet with good photographs, professionally taken photographs, so, so uh, you should uh, Google them sometime. Um, now, um, I wanted to ask, start with, with a rather broad question to both Ed and Knowledge, and you can start with whoever, you know. In when any order you want. Um, the question is, what is important to talk about today? You and me, uh, is 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 it a uh, microphone uh, silent? I can't hear him. Let me see. 
Can you guys hear me? I hear you. I'm, I'm, I'm back. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, so I have to pose the question, what is uh, of importance to talk about today? Do you want to take it first or? Well, which one of us is loaded? <laughs> um, it's like, it's like, um, you, you know, I could fire if you don't want to. Yeah, you can take uh, it. Uh, everything is the answer. Um, um, I, 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 I frankly don't know where to start. There's enough work in um, our social political landscape for everybody. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a really nice question, actually. Um, I think, uh, I think, well, as an artist, uh, and I think I heard uh, knowledge also go here. Uh, I'm very aware of trying to initiate conversation uh, to get people talking to one another um, um, and start to dimensionalize the problem for everybody. Uh, uh, I think we've been asleep, this country and particularly the citizenry, uh, and it, I just saw something uh, tonight on CNN that suggests that uh, Americans really don't know very much about the system that they're, work, they're living in and the problems. And if, if I use the metaphor of a, of a sports game, football or basketball, they don't know the rules for the game. They don't know what the teams are, who's on whose team. And they certainly don't know who the coaches and the management is. So a lot of it, it has to do as far as my analysis goes with educating the, the, the citizenry. I don't think people know where they are. Alex. Yeah. Um, back to the question. So what is of importance to talk about today? Like Ed said, everything. And sometimes I even feel nothing at all, right? Um, simultaneously. Um, sometimes I think we do a little too much talking. Um, and sometimes that the constant conversation is what actually uh, continues the process of the stirring up things, right? Um, but if, if I had to choose to talk about something, it was something that you just spoke about in regards to my Black paintings and the people's response to those paintings, um, which I was happy to hear because when I made those paintings, I made a conscious effort to make a body of work that dealt with healing rather than um, disrupting or disturbing or you know uh, some of the other things that other bodies of work that I've created in the past have done. Um, I thought I felt that it was important I was, uh, the question was posed to me at one of my artist talks after I showed the orange paintings in Los Angeles. Uh, and they asked me, what were you gonna do next? And I said, I had no idea what I was gonna do next, but whatever it, it was that I chose to do, I would uh, do it with healing in mind because I understand that the, the, the orange paintings are paintings that are rooted deeply in reality. And they, they speak to some of the uh, uh, uncomfortable truths you know, that we do need to be aware of and, and discuss and things of that nature, but then what, right? After we do all of that, then what, you know? Um, and and, and, and I, me personally, I don't wanna live in a constant state of trauma, right? And I don't wanna inflict on society this constant bombardment, um, which leads to added trauma, right? At some point we have to figure out how do we begin to heal from whatever traumas that's been inflicted upon us or others even before us that may have been bestowed down to us generation after generation after generation. And I find the best way to do that is rather than dealing with the above, the below and the around is to deal with the within. And that's what those black paintings were really about. They were, you know, um, objects of abstraction and even minimalism that, you know, uh, that, 
encourage contemplation, you know, for individuals, you know, and really to contemplate who they are, you know, what's their purpose in this world, you know what I mean, and what's going to be their contributions um, to this world, uh, going above and beyond all of the noise, right? So the original exhibition that I had for those Black paintings was an exhibition in LA at my gallery here, the No Contemporary, titled Moment of Silence, because I was looking um, to restore a sense of silence and block out some of the noise, you know, not from uh, a standpoint where I wanted to ignore, but a standpoint where I wanted to, okay, I acknowledge that, but now I'm gonna go above and beyond that and ascend beyond that, past that, um, to deal with some healing. So when I did the exhibition here in LA, the first hour of the exhibition, it was uh, encouraged that people remain totally silent, right? And, and people could come in and kind of use that moment as an opportunity to mourn the loss of maybe loved ones, um, contemplate, you know, the position in which they are, you know, where they're at in life and where they want to go and things of that nature. I wanted to restore some silence because that exhibition was done and those bodies, those paintings were done during a very noisy time in America's history, you know, in the globe's history, you know, but um, first and foremost here in America, it was very noisy. Um, and I wanted to restore a sense of silence. So for me, I think, you know, having a conversation about all of the ways in which we can disrupt you know, the things that do need to be disrupted. I also want, and, 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 I, and I feel as though there is, a, there is a correlation between disrupting and healing, right? It's like you have, like they go hand in hand, you know, but I want to keep in mind the healing part of it all and not just focus solely on the disrupting side. You know, uh, I have a question prepared here that, uh, that you have partially answered, but, uh, you know, I, I want to read it anyway, because, because uh, there are many dimensions to this. You know, there are two paintings that I particularly uh, rested at during that short slideshow, and that was at uh, Miss America Presents Domestic Violence and uh, Knowledge's License to Kill. These two, two works that, that deal with police violence. And... Um, we have, of course, had brutal violence uh, since the two of you uh, did those paintings. Is, is, is this something that you are still working with? Are, are you, are you uh, uh, driven by the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor to um, address this further? I'll take it. Um, as it pertains to producing works that either reflect or respond to um, some of the police brutality that's taking place in America. No, I haven't made any new works speaking to that. I don't plan on making any new works speaking to that. I feel as though what I did with the orange paintings um, covered that subject matter. Well, not covered it in totality, of course, because I don't feel as though there is a painting that can do that. You know, no painting that I make can cover it in totality. But that painting exists in the world where we can always refer back to and have a conversation about whether it's George Floyd, you know, Breonna Teller, you know, uh, Tamir Rice or any other, other names, Freddie Gibbs. Like, I mean, the list goes on and on and on, you know, back to when I was young, you know, with Rodney King or, you know, even going back further in history, other individuals who have had, you know, uh, the Sandra Blands of the world, not to forget her. Definitely. Um, but other individuals who have had run-ins with the police, you know, um, unhealthy run-ins with the police. So I think that, that that particular body of work touched on six different subject matters that I can always use those paintings as a, as a springboard to go into any conversation regarding any of this. You know, so, you know, I, the problem is you know, uh, the more things change, the more they remain the same. And life is very cyclical, right? And if you don't learn from certain things, you're bound to repeat them. Those paintings are there just for that, right? So whether we want to talk about Tuskegee syphilis experiment, whether we want to talk about the counterintelligence program, the war on drugs, the cocaine, the crack cocaine epidemic, you know, the mass incarceration and Clinton's 94 crime bill onto the police brutality cases that I mentioned in that body of work incidents such as these will continue to come up because this country has yet to learn um, from
from its mistakes and correct any of its errors. So anytime there needs to be a conversation about this and we want some sort of pictorial representation to point to, I made those six paintings already. So I'll just point to those six paintings, you know? Um, the same way if I want to have a conversation about black cowboys or all the other conversations that I was having with my Obama cowboy, I'll just point to the Obama cowboy. I don't feel the need to make another cowboy painting. Ed. Uh, <clears throat> I think that, um, well, first, I think the context that we're all living in is there is no democracy in the United States of America. There isn't. Uh, it's an all or nothing thing. And either everybody's got to say and everybody gets dealt with with an equal hand or they don't. So the rest, we are able to go down the road talking about democracy and demanding it from other nations on the planet without having it ourselves. And the way we're able to do what we do is that we pretend that there's a uh, democracy in the United States. I am, uh, uh, Martin Luther King went to India uh, at one point in his life and uh, they said, uh, oh, you're an untouchable, aren't you? Because we live in a caste system, not a democracy. So these are the words right now coming out of, uh, uh, I'm an untouchable. And, uh, but everybody pretends that I'm not. They pretend that there is a democracy here. And I guess my job as an artist is to try to attack the psyche that is able to hold the kinds of contradictions that Americans can hold in claiming that this is land of the free, home of the brave, great democracy, the greatest democracy that the planet has ever known. That's kind of bullshit, isn't it? Uh, I, 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 for, for some reason, I, I don't think of either one of you as, as primarily a political artist. Uh, although both of you are very, have very strong uh, social commentary, uh, it goes beyond commentary, you know, uh, in your art. But, uh, and, and both of you are, are artists who have really pushed people to think. Uh, and Ed, at, at, uh, at the, uh, one point in your life, you, you uh, were doing a guerrilla style street performance and, and, and theater, and, and in, if I remember correctly, in response to the Watts riots in was it sixty five? Can you talk a little bit about uh, uh, political art and political action? Where do you see see the these coming together, balance or not? I think. Uh, you know, the arts can be, as we all know, uh, a lot of things. Um, they can be pictures of, of, of lovely pastoral scenes that uh, hang over your mother or your grandmother's sofa and that uh, they don't even see anymore because obviously anything you see all the time at one point you don't see anymore uh, or the the arts can be more challenging and um, the arts can be a weapon um, they can demand they can educate and so forth the bodacious boogarilla was the name of the theater group that i was part of and um we used to talk about ourselves as both a mirror for our audiences and a window through which to see. Uh, kind of like my statement I made earlier, I think the philosophy of the group was to start to question this 
kind of fake reality that we're all living in and um, start to give dimension to. And the arts can do a very good job of dimensionalizing ideas, alternative ideas, um, maybe uh, as opposed to alternative realities, um, can give some kind of dimension to the life and the, and the kind of fantasy we are living in. I feel like I'm in some kind of strange corporate movie that uh, has a whole lot of ways for people to think and live and be that have nothing whatsoever to do with uh, certainly the needs in my life. I'm sure this fantasy is very nice for uh, very wealthy people and uh, corporate leaders. But uh, I think, and another idea just hit my head, uh, we are living in a, a time when the, mo uh, when the media, aided by um, computers, can absolutely create visually anything any fantasy, any kind of delusion, any kind of reality, and in fact, some super kinds of reality. And we watch that. And depending on who is producing that, in this country, I believe uh, we don't live in a democracy, we live in a corporatocracy, then the movies and the fantasies that we look at are sponsored by that kind of corporate mentality. So um, I think it's the illusion that we're living in and the fantasy and the delusions that we have to experience every day uh, skews how we see life, skews how we see ourselves and presents an incredible challenge for anybody who wants to talk about or critique uh, uh, on that way and other ways of living. Was that too wordy and too out there? I think thought that was uh, really good. I uh, told us quite a bit more than, than uh, my simple <laughs> question. Than you asked for, yeah. Uh, now, uh, I don't want to just talk about politics. I said that I don't think of the two of you as primarily a political artist because uh, your works really have have many dim dim dimensions and uh, uh, I, I find it strong visually and uh, both of you have a strong and very distinct individual voices. So. Uh, I want to ask how you developed your visual vocabulary. Um, I would, I would say I developed my visual vocabulary early on um, through observation. You know, through observation. Um, I often, when I have a conversation about art being a visual language. Right, it's one of the ways in which we express ourselves, but we do it, well, this type of art painting, right? Or mark making on some sort of two dimensional surface or even sculptures or what have you. But from a visual perspective, um, it's, it's, I think some artists who have struck a chord in a way, they actually develop languages. And I think other artists until they reach that point, if they ever reach that point to develop their own language, they're using another artist's language to express themselves, right? So for instance, none of us created the English language, right? But we're all here using this language to express ourselves, you know? So I feel as though like in aesthetics, you know, when you start to deal with the aesthetics of, of, of art, um, there are certain artists who have very distinct aesthetics, right? And then there are those of us who use these aesthetics 
to, to have a different conversation than maybe that particular artist was having. So early in my career, you know, which is still, I'm still early in my career, but even earlier, you know, I chose the aesthetic that Andy Warhol was using. And there was several different reasons why I liked the aesthetic and chose to use it. One, my background originally was in photography, but it was more on the service side of things. So I was, you know, I would do, you know, photo shoots for models and people looking for, you know, uh, let's say headshots, you know, who wanted to be in uh, film or theater or what or whatnot, right? But mainly I focused in fashion photography and portrait work. When I kind of grew tired of that and wanted something a bit more and I wanted to actually begin to express myself and not just serve, you know, um, from a purely service perspective, you know, I began to study fine art photography. I wanted something where I can kind of go do on my own and then produce these images that I could possibly multiply as far as additions and then put out into the world that way. Um, while doing that, I stumbled upon Andy Warhol's work in a more formal manner. Like being in New York, you come in contact with his work. It's some, you know, at, at one point in time, it pretty much was like the backdrop of the city. But at this point in time, I was more so formally studying his work and I, I, I related to it for several different reasons. One, the subject matter, um, to the aesthetics of it, which was so close to photography. Um, um, and, and three, the outsider element that existed where it didn't necessarily look like the things in which I've been told my entire life was real fine art. You know, so all three of those things resonated with me. So I began to explore not only his work, but the, 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 the process of producing that type of work. And through my exploration, I ended up teaching myself how to produce such work. And I've started making a different style of work. And then around 2000 and maybe 12, I made the decision that I wanted to pay homage, you know, to this artist by taking and reimagining four to five of his works of art that resonated probably with me and with the mass populace the most. You know, so that led me to producing the cowboy paintings, the Coke bottles, the Mao Trump, um, the, uh, the, what, the, what else is there? Coke bottles, Mao Trump, oh, the Merlin Monroe piece. Um, and my Cajonas series is somewhat related to that because the method of production is the same and, 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 and the simplistic, you know, this, this, this serigraphed image on top of just this, you know, color filled background, you know, it still was, in alignment with it, but the imagery was not imagery that Andy ever, ever used, you know. Um, but that was my way of developing my visual, you know, uh, aesthetic and language early on, you know, so I chose to, I chose to that aesthetic to express myself to have different conversations with what Andy was having maybe 50 years prior to me, you know, um, and then once you kind of, you know, the art world and art history and, and just the plethora of art that's out here is like a rabbit hole, right? You start somewhere and then you kind of go down this hole and it's just, it never ends. So then I begin to become more uh, knowledgeable of other periods of art and other artists and other, you know, um, you know, movements that was taking place even outside of America, you know, and then that too had, you know, influence on my work, right? And then as many artists do, I began to look to nature, right? I began to look to the things that just surrounded me in the natural world, you know, and that also was, you know, one of the ways in which I began to express myself because it was like looking at the night sky is also how I arrived at those black paintings, right? I was looking at something that was, you know, somewhat all encompassing. So when I wanted to have a larger conversation, I was looking at a larger canvas, which was literally like the sky. You know, so I think we, we, you know, different artists come to their different, you know, ways of expressing themselves or whatever that visual language is through different means, but that's the way that I, I rock. Ed, how about you? Um, I, mine is relatively clear, I think. Um, as a kid living in a relatively small country town, uh, I was influenced initially a lot by comic books and uh, the superheroes and the not so superheroes. And um, 
um, I've, I have always drawn. My, my, my parents, my relatives said, I dropped out of my mother and crawled over to the first pencil I could find and I started making marks. Well, that, those marks were highly influenced by comic books. Uh, as I got a little older, because of my age, I was living through the Second World War and Life Magazine. And Life Magazine was kind of my Bible because of the photographs of the Second World War. And I basically fell in love with the aesthetics of the Germans and the Nazis. Now, everybody has a hard time with me saying that, but that's their problem. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, there was a mentality, a, a aesthetic that produced the machinery, the uniforms, the weapons, uh, the regalia. And for some reason or another, that aesthetic really grabbed me. And I think I was, I didn't realize it until later, but I think it was about power. Uh, those aesthetics, uh, I mean, you get this little guy with this funny mustache and the hair goes over one eye and he's standing at a podium with 50 feet of uh, uh, drapery hanging behind him and it goes to the right uh, for uh, 400 feet and it goes to the left for 400 feet and um, he's got on his right he's got 2,000 guys in gray outfits and to his left he's got 2,000 guys in black outfits and behind them are, is an audience that goes on forever and he says right above him is this image of this crooked cross. I'm talking visually, I'm not talking ideologically. I'm going, man, that's killer, man. That's powerful stuff for my eye. So I think that aesthetic did influence a lot of where I was to go. At the same time, being a young black child in the United States of America, and I came from a family of musicians, uh, I was listening to a lot of music and the culture uh, that was expressed through the music, particularly the blues. Um, and and um, uh, before it was rock and roll for the, for the uh, mainstream, it was rhythm and blues. And I loved that aesthetic. It's raw, it's direct, it's cutting, it's, um, it's, it is what it is, it's, it's not pretending. And I, I was a little older and was aware that I wanted my art to do that, to be, and, and if nothing else, to have that raw quality. Uh, obviously, there was a point at which I got caught in the uh, Watts riots and uh, all those experiences, all those aesthetics that I had going into the Watts riots and being having that be an awakening in many ways I, I automatically used my past experience and the, and the power of those past aesthetics to influence maybe my conversation socially and politically. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I wanna follow up on this a little bit. Uh, knowledge you talked about uh, anti Warhol. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's very clear that you're working with Andy Warhol, you, you, you know, you, you uh, appropriate certain things in it. But uh, when if, if I looked at, if I saw a picture of your work unidentified in a magazine, in a say, I would immediately know that that was your work. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so 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 yeah you you go back to uh pop art but but uh but you uh make it yours absolutely um but i also know that you you uh look at other artists and have been uh, profoundly inspired by them you know we had richard serra we had uh, barnett newman works in, in in your exhibition works that you you uh I uh, wanted to include, uh, we, we talked about Ad Reinhardt uh, and um, Barnett Newman, absolutely. Um, what is your relationship to American art history? You know, how do you see yourself in re relation to, to the history of contemporary art or, or you know, since World War II? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... So, as I mentioned, when I left photography and began to study uh, painting, right, I started with Andy Warhol. And then I started to go back in time, right, to the periods that preceded him. Um, and one of the periods that I fell in love with most uh, was the New York School of Art, that particular period, abstract expressionism, um, 1940s, 50s, you know, still going in the 60s, even after Andy and them came. But it was something about uh, a sense of freedom that I saw in their practice and a sense of, I think they all had courage. I think, you know, what the guys in, you know, the New York School of Art was kind of looking to break away from and establish, you know, here in America on their own um, to be taken serious as an American art form. Um, one that could be recognized on a global platform. Um, I think it took courage to be able to do that, to kind of tear away from what Picasso and a lot of the European artists were making at the time. Um, the same way it took courage for Andy and them to kind of restore a sense of lightness, you know, uh, not so seriousness to art coming on the heels of, of, you know, that particular movement to abstract expression, right? Because that body, that particular period in art was a very serious uh, intellectual, you know, uh, moment in, in fine art. So when I began to study those guys, that, that movement, you know, I really fell in love with the freedom that they had. And I always wanted to make work uh, that was similar to that because it resonated with me immediately. But early on, I felt as though the audience that I had access to, and for me, art making, it's a dialogue, it's not a monologue. Right, it's it's me entering into a conversation um, with the past, present, and the future. Right, it's not just me standing in a room alone talking to myself. You know, um, so I'm always looking to have a conversation through my work. Right, it's visual communication. So the people who I had access to early on, I didn't feel as though they would be able to read or understand what it was that I was attempting to say if I was to just start off with these abstract works. You know. Um, keeping in mind that I didn't come to art through some MFA program. I didn't have that particular network of people who I can put my work in front of. You know, I was starting in my community where, where, you know, where I grew up at. And I'm literally probably offering this community at that time, one of their first formal introductions to the world of fine art, you know? So I wanted to present at that time works that they could digest so we can start this journey together. And many of those, you know, uh, individuals or groups of people who became fans of my work back then, they've since come along with me on this journey, which is what Road to Damascus, back to the title of that exhibition, was partly talking about, you know, that journey that I took to deal with some sort of sense of transcendence in my own life. But I'm bringing other people along with me on this journey. And as I learn, I'm teaching and they're learning and we're going back and forth. So I always kept that in mind. So I started off with the pop work because I feel as though pop art is like the perfect gateway drug into art, right? But then once you get into it, I begin to um, delve into other avenues. And one of them was, you know, that uh, abstract expressionism or minimalism, you know, color fill paintings and things of that nature. So some of the names that you mentioned, you know, the Barnett Newmans, the Mark Rothko's, the Ad Reinhardt's, the Clifford Stills, like all of these were people who, work I came across before I knew anything about them, you know, I was struck by the work. And then as I dug a little deeper, I began to get to know them, you know, their, their personal histories, 
you know, so then I was also moved by that. But what wasn't available to me, or so, shall I say readily available at that time, because I was doing most of my research online, what wasn't so readily available was the contributions of Black artists who too was making, you know, uh, abstract works at that time, but didn't necessarily get the platforms, you know, that uh, many of these artists back then were getting, right? And, it, and I remember some years back when I moderated a conversation at Western, uh, I believe it was Ed Burrill who made the statement saying that when they were back in South Central Los Angeles, I believe it was in the 60s, that many of the artists, they themselves wanted to make works that delved in abstraction and things of that nature. But the, the system that was in play wanted them to constantly have this conversation about um, politics, you know, like create political work. I think every work of art is political, first of all. You know, I don't think you can create any work of art and not be political. Um, you know, but so 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 that was a, a, a it was a it was something that it was a bittersweet moment for me because yes, there was frustrations that arose because I'm like, damn, once again, you know, you're 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 acknowledge you're 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 being forced to acknowledge the racism that existed within this here this other industry this art world right. And, and looking at a lot of the, the, the talented artists of that period who didn't get a shot, who work was marginalized and things of that nature, or who probably had to end up painting something that they didn't necessarily want to paint, or they just didn't have the luxury of doing both. Um, that was a bit frustrating, but when I did come to know some of them and get to study their works, and I'm still doing that to this day, um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot, not only about those artists, but I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about the advantages that I have today and that I have to take full advantage of those advantages and express myself um, within my practice, however I see fit at that particular point in time and not allow any barriers you know, to uh, restrict me because these men before me, men and women before me, they, they carried those crosses so that I didn't have to bear that cross, right? So. I'm able to express myself in ways that many of them weren't able to. So I'm forever thankful and grateful for that. You know, so I'm always paying homage to them as well. And just thinking of some of the abstract painters of today who work I'm deeply in love with, you know, you think about the, the Mark Bradford's of the world, you know, someone who I feel as though is carrying the torch of abstraction and, and as we say, representing to the fullest, you know, um, cause I can dive into his work and, and stay there for days or weeks or months or years. Um, there's some. There's a few other names who, who jump out to me. Oh, it was uh, uh, what is Stanley Whitney? I bumped into Stanley in Basel, Switzerland, during Art Basel one day. I didn't know who he was. I never knew of him as an artist. Um, but something. But we were all on the tram together, and something about him struck me. And anybody running around Basel during the time of Art Basel in Switzerland especially a black man, he's there because he's somebody, you know, this is not a trip that you just take if you're just looking to, for a vacation, you know? So I ended up asking around, who was this guy? Who was this guy? And people told me who he was and I never approached him because I'm, you know, when it comes to doing things like that, I'm a bit shy about that. I don't really just run up on people, but I began to study Stanley's work and his, you know, the way in which he works with color theory with his paintings, that also struck me as something that where I'm seeing somebody who's carrying that torch of abstraction um, in modern day times and, and, and doing it the right way. Um, Sam Gillian, another one, you know, whose work, who, I, who I've had the opportunity to sit in front of and listen to one of his conversations he had, one of his art talks he did not too far from my gallery in the arts district um, in, in LA. And uh, brilliant man, brilliant mind and brilliant work. You know, so I, yes, those names that you mentioned was how I, you know, was, was the way in which I was first introduced to abstraction. Um, but then from there, I kind of went out and began to study so many other artists. Yeah. Ed, uh, I, I want to ask you the same question about your relationship to uh, the to American art history. Uh, but I want to, uh, you know, bring up a little bit in context, you know, this this painting that I uh, showed, the last painting I showed in slideshow, uh, you know it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a painting and, and collage with, with collaged paper, you know, a newspaper. 
but uh, uh, this kind of passages see in a lot of your work, uh, work that we look at first and we see uh, some uh, outrageous things going on perhaps, or, or, or uh, you know, uh, representations that are, are very strong and jump out of, out of us, but then uh, spent a little time in, in front of the work and uh, until you uh, start seeing the um, thing itself. And, uh, you know, see, see this passage, They're very abstract, very uh, strong and, expressionistic i think what do you say what what, what 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 is your relationship to to art history well um one of the things i i am going to say which might or might not have anything to do with your question um miles davis was asked about some of his music that he uh he was rather famous for and his answer was, man, I can't stand to hear that shit. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm not gonna say quite that relative to the drawing. That's a drawing, it's, it's eight and a half by 11s on a sheet of paper. And I did a ton of those trying to find out uh, where I was, who I was, uh, where, what, what really knocked me out and what didn't. Um, again, I think as I look at that with you, uh, the blues and a more raw approach to what I was trying to do was very much present in that period of time where uh, I was, I was, I was schooled by some good artists uh, who were at the time teaching at Chouinard Art, Art Institute where I was studying. And um, they came out of uh, and were dealing with abstract expressionism at, at the time. Uh, at the same time, I don't think an artist can let go of their culture uh, regardless of what what the focus of their work happens to be. And uh, so they were coming out of um, a, a really a, a European Western uh, defined uh, art historical background. Uh, and um, I think, I frankly think abstract expressionism for European culture was a, a temporary dealing with messy and dirty and raw. Because ultimately, uh, for most of my teachers at the time who were painting these abstract expressionist paintings, um, they eventually ended up in one form or another being Ellsworth Kelly, very hard edged, clean, neat and white. Um, I didn't want to go there. That was of no interest to me. Uh, and I think this, I said this to you, if I took that art and used it as a metaphor for food, I wouldn't eat that. That's not interesting to me. And I don't want to put it in my mouth. Uh, so, um, my influences were uh, um, artists who maybe you wouldn't think of formally as artists. Uh, one of my heroes as an artist was Michael Jordan. Um, they asked him, and it was, I think his creativity was incredible, but they asked him once, when you're dribbling down the court and there's five seven foot guys down there who want the ball and they want to, uh, if, they, if it was a dark alley, they want to murder you. What, how do you know what you're gonna do? He said, I don't. I have no idea what I'm gonna do. There's only one thing I know. 
this basketball is going to go through that hoop. And when he makes that happen, the audience goes, and particularly black men go, oh, God, oh, God, damn, oh, shit, oh, did you see? Oh, man, oh, wow. He just took us to another place. And I think it's very necessary for me um, to fall in love with an artist. It's because in large part or in a small part, they take me to another place that's outside or it's on the other side of some other place. I think um, uh, sometimes, believe it or not, John Singer Sargent does that. Look at how, what the brush is doing in those dresses that he paints, those gowns, satin gowns. Um, uh, there's a couple of, once in a while, Muhammad Ali drops into uh, a very artistic place. Uh, if you don't get sidetracked by all the bizarre activity, um, and it's not bizarre if you want to unsettle your opponent, but periodically, physically, uh, he is a beautiful artist. I think Harley Davidson motorcycles are kind of dumb as motorcycles, but they're kind of interesting sculpture. Um, you can see where I'm kind of going. I, I, I think uh, Johann Sebastian Bach does a really nice job in a couple of compositions he wrote. Um, so does, um, so does um, um, Beethoven. Um, once in a while, those notes start to go to another place. And if I get into music, I cannot leave out um, uh, John Coltrane. And, and I have been able to, and I think I shared with you the other day, um, of being able to take the music and he instructed me, in spite of the fact that we're working in two different media, he instructed me on some very, very important and interesting technical things that I have to, uh, that I got from him and that uh, I, I paid a great deal of attention to. Um, I think I could go on. And by the way, um, my influences early on were definitely living on the West Coast. Car culture, absolutely car culture, um, and, which included drag racing and power again. It's it's uh, uh, wonderful to hear both of you talk about about this relationship. Uh, <clears throat> you know your your admiration for for, for these famous artists, but also uh, uh, you know s s certain uh, uh, impatience with with them. You know it being so such a white culture, and the feeling that that um, that it doesn't. Fully uh, uh, represents what you are doing. Is it, uh, uh, and, and both of you going into into music and music that uh, uh, you know jazz and, and music that is is uh, uh, where the main artists are are African American. So so uh, uh, and and looking for for inspiration there. It's interesting. Um, To, to shift the conversation a little bit, uh, 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 knowledge. I know that you have an exhibition coming up. <clears throat> uh, can you tell us what what uh, you're showing there? What are you? What is your new work? Where are you going? Uh, I don't necessarily like to talk about the work before I put it out in the world. But what it's funny. Um, so we talked earlier about some of the missed opportunities at Western Washington with my exhibition due to. Uh, the snowstorm and freezing over that took place in the earlier part of the exhibition, then the COVID-19 um, coming in the later part and kind of shutting down the show. 
I've had now, uh, I have now the opportunity to do a lot of what was going to be done at Western, but now at a university here on the East Coast, Keene University over in uh, Union, New Jersey. Um, so come September, I'll be doing a full university takeover where I'm taking over five to six galleries on campus um, and presenting new bodies of work along with maybe one of the galleries presenting some of my older works. Um, there will be painting, there will be, I've actually picked back up my camera. So there should be some photography there as well. Um, yeah, went, went back to film photography rather than digital. Um, that's gonna take place. We're looking at doing a couple different new styles of work that's gonna be there. One of the things that uh, Ed spoke about earlier was his uh, fascination early on with some of the um, German military, you know, in their aesthetics. Well, and speaking about World War II, I was recently gifted um, from a departed uncle of mine through my aunt who's still here, these portraits of all of these uh, black soldiers um, during World War II, who was, my uncle was in World War II, my great uncle was in World War II, and they would do these portrait sessions that they would basically almost use as like a, their version of a baseball card or what have you, where they would, <clears throat> you know, uh, sign and hand out to one another in exchange. So anyway, she uh, was recently moving out of uh, the, the home that she's lived in for a very long time and discovered these uh, portraits. And she gave me about 38 of them. And um, this was maybe less than a year ago. And I've been trying to figure out, scratching my head, what do I want to do with these images? Because I have to do something with them. He was an uncle of mine who every time I would see him, he would go in his pocket and give me a couple coins of uh, change or what have you. So I look at this as another gift that he's given me even um, long after he's since departed. But uh, so that's going to, I'm going to find a way to include these World War II portraits um, into this exhibition and have a conversation about, you know, these men in that particular period in time and kind of just, you know, give them this opportunity that none of them probably would even think of during their time that one day they would be, you know, uh, these images would be turned into works of art and, you know, um, aside from photographs and uh, have it exhibited so that the world can see. So that's something that I'm really excited about, you know, and I'm starting, well, I've already started production, but on those particular images, I'll be starting production within the next couple of weeks here in the gallery. And um, yeah, but it's gonna be a full on takeover of the university and a lot of the things that we couldn't do at Western, we're gonna do there. And, you know, um, a lot of interaction with the students, a lot of classroom work with the students, even bringing the students out to Los Angeles for a uh, independent studies program that we're putting together here at the gallery in relation to the university. So, uh, so that's happening. And then in July, uh, Freeze LA, the Freeze Art Fair, which has been in LA, I believe for the last two years, which normally takes place in the month of February has because of COVID been shifted to uh, July. So we're gonna do an exhibition at my gallery here where it's gonna be a two artist exhibition. Upstairs is gonna be a young woman, Yo Yolanda, um, with her you know, uh, collage works. And then downstairs will be another iteration of my black paintings. Um, so I'm looking forward to that as well. So that's pretty much my calendar for 2021 that I can foresee now, July and September, with these two big exhibitions. Ed, I know that you uh, spend every day in the studio. What are you working on? Oh, um, I've, I think I'm, well, in part recovering, still recovering from having a retrospective a year ago. Uh, but uh, the retrospective and what I was working on at the time has suggested um, some really, uh, what I think is really uh, interesting work. I won't try to describe it, but I'm trying to produce, I think what I would laughingly call a poor man's hologram. Uh, I'm, I'm doing 
three-dimensional drawings uh, and uh, uh, things that float um, or appear to be floating in midair. Um, I think uh, it's about, um, and this is, this is the first time maybe the technical aspect of what I'm working on is, is starting to talk about the conceptual or the, or the ideas that I'm interested in. I think to be as quick on this as I can, I think we don't think uh, the way human beings think is so determined by what we're afraid of uh, that uh, we end up going against our nature, going against nature, going against learning even more. And what I mean by that is um, we think in closed circuits, boxes. We put our, we get an idea and we box it up and that's it. Uh, well, the unfortunate thing is, is that the universe seems to be uh, everything being related and not being a boxed up container, but an open situation in, sp in spite of the fact that there is a certain amount of what we call chaos to deal with. So to make a long story short, I'm trying to produce images that keep the question or the statement or the idea open so that it can grow. It can, uh, in spite of the fact that, okay, that's a table, that's a stove, that's my friend, that's my enemy, uh, want to be closed circuits, you keep it open because there's going to be new information coming in whether you want to have it there or not because everything is related and you cannot have a thinking process that cuts off uh, incoming information. Uh, when we've got absolutely incredible examples of disasters where we have said in effect that's it and nothing else well inevitably something else is going to come along and blow it up um our 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 desire to say hey let me get in here and straighten all this stuff out well you can cancel that you can count, that is not going to work. And I would like to produce works that help or invite people to keep the question open, to keep the statement open by giving them images that are not, that they have to finish completing. Chris, I was wondering if, if you could take, a, take questions or have received any questions. Chris is our technical genius. Hi, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen any questions yet in the, in the chat, but um, we certainly invite uh, any of you who have any questions or any follow-ups that the discussion has spurred, go ahead and post them in the chat. Um, and if a lot come in at once, just be patient with us and uh, we'll, we'll try to address them as we can. Let me then ask you, Knowledge, when we talked the other day, you uh, quoted Toni Morrison, and I thought it was, first of all, a very interesting quote, and what, what you followed up on that quote with about your art was really uh, interesting to me. I wonder if, if you can say something about that. Give us a quote. Um, well, it wasn't necessarily a quote. I pretty much paraphrased uh, a converse, a statement that she made within a conversation that she was having. Um, and the reason for that paraphrasing of that statement was I was asked a question, uh, would any of my new work still, um, or would any of my new work revisit this, 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 uh, 
the circumstances that surround police brutality, you know, or maybe even COVID-19 or some of the other things that are taking place right now within the world. And, uh, and it was something that Toni Morrison said that really resonated with me where, um, from a paraphrasing standpoint, she spoke to how she didn't necessarily feel the need to uh, have whiteness at the center of her practice or her writings, um, where she didn't necessarily feel the need to always have this, uh, this white character or this white savior or, this, or, or this, just this token character who always had to be present in the writings as, as they are oftentimes in a lot of the uh, creative works of other black creators. And, and for good reason, you know what I'm saying, at times. And, 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 and then also at other times where it just was like this, where it's, I think some creatives feel the need to uh, always have to include them. And the reason why I responded with that paraphrasing of what Tony said, because when we talk about a lot of times, like for instance, this is Black History Month, right? And people would say, no, it's all we want to talk about the orange paintings because it's Black History Month. And I said, well, what about the orange paintings that you want to talk about because it's Black History Month? Because for me, history is something that you make, right? And though the atrocities that took place on those canvases, what well, took place in the real world that's reflected on those canvases are not things in which the, the, was made in the Black community. These were things that were made by another community inflicted upon the black community. So that's a different story. So I would tell people, oh, oh this is white history. You wanna talk about the T T T Tuskegee syphilis experiment? This is white history. You wanna talk about the war on drugs? This is white history. You wanna talk about crack cocaine epidemic and so forth and so on, right? This is white history. So if you wanna talk about that, we can, but let's not talk about it because it's black history month, right? Like that's not what, that, that's not what those paintings are talking about. Those paintings are basically mirrors that we put up to society and show you what's happening. And we know who are the, the, who's at the helm as it pertains to the power structure within the society, right? So that's who those paintings are reflecting. Now, yes, there is some reflected uh, trauma that exists, you know, uh, on, that's, that's being represented on those paintings as it pertains to the black community, but that's not history that we made. That's history that we've been uh, gravely affected by, you know. So, so, so now moving forward, I was talking about how when I got to my black paintings, one of the things that I was conscious of was that I was going to have a conversation that didn't have to include any of this other madness or noise that's going on in the world, right? And for some people, those paintings may be too minimal. They may be. They may not be loud enough. You know, but they was right on time for me. They was, as, as they say, it was uh, precisely what the doctor prescribed, right? Or doctor ordered, you know, for me. And it didn't have to center around politics in that, in the lowbrow way, you know, the lowest hanging fruit of politics. It didn't have to center around politics in that way. It didn't have to center around race relations in that way. It didn't have to center around any sort of injustices or, or disenfranchisement or anything in that way. And by doing that, you know, there are those who that upsets because now they're no longer at the center of this conversation that me as an artist is having, you know, and it was just uh, uh, my way of reminding people whiteness is not at the center of my blackness. My blackness is not a response to whiteness, you know, um, and I respect all the work that all artists make, you know, as long as they're being true to the voice that they have and saying actually what they want to say and not necessarily reading from a script. But sometimes it feels as though people are reading from a script because everybody seems to be saying the same thing. And I don't have a problem with <clears throat> saying some of the things that other people say as well, because that's, that's cool, but not in a contrived way. Not in a way where all of a sudden all of these white owned galleries are representing all of these artists, but they can, it appears as if they can only produce work that has this one dimensional conversation, you know? So which is one of the reasons why I built my own gallery because I wanted to have true freedom to express myself how I see fit. I wanted to be able to talk about the things in which I felt as though needed to be discussed. Um, and, I, and when I no longer want to discuss something, I want to have the, the freedom to do that as well. You know, And I've worked with galleries in the past and, and I know how galleries can be where you have this particular style or aesthetic 
that seems to resonate with people and is doing really good commercially, you know, it's like, why do you want to switch things up and explore anything new? Because that's what art is all about, right? Art is about this constant ex exploration, you know, where you don't necessarily have to finish where you started. Or you may very well do that because, like I said earlier, things are cyclical. You know, so that's what I was talking about with Toni Morrison, um, where, you know, sometimes it could become a bit uh, mundane to continue going in and out of gallery after gallery or museum after museum. And when it's a Black artist, you know,'s work on exhibit, all you have to do is read the, you know, uh, the statement on the exhibition and you could kind of already know what's going to be going on in there. You know what I mean? So many times it's the same it's the same uh, conversation being had. And not that these aren't serious conversations that need to be had, but we have other conversations too that we need to be having. And I for one is definitely gonna take the liberty to do that. So um, yeah, so, you know, so, so that, that's what that was all about. Chris, how about now? <clears throat> Seems that some questions have been coming in. Yes, absolutely. We have, we have, uh about six or seven that have come in did you did you want uh, to take a look at them or do you want me to just sort of start at the top and interpret as best i can well i saw one question about about something that i haven't raised in this conversation uh but interesting uh fact that there are what 40 years difference in your age you grew up in different time uh I feel that your, your work is in direct conversation as if you were of the same generation, but you're not. You know, uh, Ed grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, you, uh, Knowles grew up in, in New York. Now, now Knowles lives in Los Angeles, probably a very different Los Angeles, or maybe not. Uh, what is, I think it was Steve Giordano who, who asked that question. Can you read the full question to me? Chris. Yeah, yeah. It's um, is, I'm interested in your 40 years difference in age, a generation plus, yet you both have lived through some of the same times and upheavals. Do you see each other as representing different generations? Mm. Um, I'll take that. Um, probably Although I don't, I don't feel like knowledge is that far away from my sensibilities and my experience. And maybe it's because um, a, a 40 year difference in our ages uh, have really don't make a lot of difference in a uh, a kind of racist, sexist, uh, him, uh, 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 society culture that everything changes, but it always stays the same. Uh, we're still dealing with kind of the same issues uh, that we were dealing with, you know, 200 years ago. Uh, it's got a little more chrome and uh, it's, is freshly painted, but it's still the same, uh, what I like to call illusions. Uh, and keeping those illusions alive uh, requires some, often handling it slightly different, but they're the same illusions. And um, uh, my youth uh, that I recall and listening to knowledge talk about his, some of his experiences and where he came from, really don't feel that distant or that far away from the way I came up. The monster is the same. And the challenges, uh, monster being social, political, um, aesthetics um, and painting and sculpture and making art kind of occupies the same place, um, how you do it and what you decide to talk about, uh, I guess is limited by your experiences 
And if uh, knowledge and I have the same experiences, we've chosen to deal with those, um, maybe in a personally different, but uh, same challenges, same problem. Honest, do you want to add to this, or shall we go to another question? Or? Um, I mean, like Ed says, I mean, of course, there's definitely similarities, and 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 um, <laughs> not much have changed. Um, but for me, in order for change to come about, like we have to change, right? I'm not waiting for, you know, the power structure or, or, or change to happen on a systemic level, um, because that change doesn't benefit the system, right? It wouldn't be in the best interest. The change that would positively affect me wouldn't necessarily be in the best interest of the system. So I'm not gonna sit around and wait for that to happen. You know, I take uh, agency over my own life, my own uh, practice, my career, and I encourage other artists, you know, especially um, those who stem from my community to do the same, right? So if you wanna see less uh, discrimination take place within galleries, you know, I don't, I'm not necessarily uh, too hopeful about galleries having, or any of these establishments having, let's say some racial sensitivity training that's gonna all of a sudden fix the problem. No, the problem is build your own, build your own, build your own institutions, build your own galleries, build your own houses where people can exhibit work in, where people can have, uh, actually truly have, uh, these moments of creative expression in safe spaces for real, where you don't necessarily always have to have the white gaze, you know, where you don't necessarily have to contemplate, you know, how is this going to affect this other person because they may not necessarily understand it from a cultural perspective. You know, like I don't want to deal with all of that. Like I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it, how I want to do it. And that's just, that's the way I've always been. And I carry that in my practice. Now I'm a responsible, uh, individual where, you know, I'm not looking to burn any bridges that don't necessarily need to be burned. But I, but I also feel as though, you know, some bridges are best burned where we don't necessarily need to go back and forth and continue this constant uh, entanglement with such madness, you know? So, it, so things will change when we change. So I just position myself to be the power, to be the change that I wanna see, you know? All right, let me add to that because I think we also, Knowledge and I also share the point of view that, uh, and I'll put it in my terms, I belong to me. Uh, and I, I found myself writing something down the other day that went something like, nobody can tell me what to want. Nobody can tell me who to be. Uh, and I'm standing, and I think knowledgeable might agree, we're standing on the shoulders of a lot of people who couldn't say that, mm -hmm. who had to pay an enormous price to produce uh, Knowledge Bennett, to produce Ed Burrell, in spite of the fact that I've, I've watched that whole process go on. It's at a point where I can just say, hey, I don't, I'm not, I am not, slavery is not the center of my mind. And its results are not the center. Of, and, and actually, I can take it further, being some kind of hero, some kind of um, John Wayne or some kind of Sylvester Stallone I don't have those models that guide who I'm going to be and what I'm going to think about. I have, and I, I will fight to my death to be able to think about anything I want to think about. That does not belong to anybody else. And, um, I therefore am always monitoring who I am um, in relation to what the atmosphere or the environment happens to be at any one time, because 
this fantasy that we're all living in is very seductive. And you can be well down the road of being somebody else before you even know it. My grandfather used to say to me, little boy, don't ever forget this. If you don't have yourself, you ain't got nothing. So I've always kind of gone there, um, regardless of how old I was and am, and I hope I have enough time to finish the work I'm working on. Please, shall we take one more question? I, I, you know, we've been talking for a long time. I'm losing my voice, but uh, you are doing well. <laughs> uh, yeah, do you, now there's, there's uh, about uh, six other questions in there. Did you, did you look at any particular ones? Uh, no. Or just, do you just want to see what's in there? Any, anything that you have. Okay. Uh, um, what, what is what does Steve want to ask us? Is, That's a familiar face, and he's Steve a Bernardo, adult. The question that, oh, we got Steve. We we nailed we nailed Steve right out of the gate there. Um, let's see here. Um, do, 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 do. There's a question particularly for knowledge um, couple. Uh, there's one I think. Um, I think this is an interesting one um, from uh, Margaret Bickman. Um, and she asked, how do both of you capture a seat at the table, not the other table, but the table of the world, so to speak? You've both uh, done that, but how do you stay there? Does that make sense? Um, mm. Well, a seat at the table. Uh, first and foremost, I'm, I'm definitely of the mindset that as long as I build my own table, I'll always have a seat at it um, if I so choose to. And then the world, you know, I work in a way where the world comes to me, right? And I also go to the world. There is this exchange, you know, this, this uh, authentic, organic exchange that takes place. It's not as calculated as some people may think. Um, or, or might imagine there is a lot that takes place organically with my practice and within my career. Um, and maybe if I was a bit more strategic at times, uh, I would be further along, but I'm, I'm pretty cool where I'm at right now. And uh, I plan to continuing, continuing to grow as a person and therefore grow as an artist, grow as a human being. Um, and in doing so, uh, I trust the process that there would be this ongoing exchange between myself and others who I come in contact with, because that's just the way that the universe works. Um, so, but definitely uh, building my own table and having whatever exchange that we're going to have, let's have it at, I'll invite you guys over. We can have it at my table, you know? So that's, that's pretty much, I mean, just, just being one with the world. I mean, I deal with things on a holistic standpoint, right? So I deal with oneness. You know, I don't see the world as this fragmented place, although it appears that way to the naked eye from a physical uh, standpoint, but from a spiritual and more of a, you know, uh, conscious, collective conscious standpoint, there's a oneness that exists that I'm tapped into and wish to remain tapped into and I'm doing the work to remain tapped into. And that oneness is going to serve me and I'm going to serve it and that's going to be my my uh, trajectory moving forward. Ed, I'm sure you have uh, something to say about this. Uh, yeah, right. I'm I'm uh, I think of the same mind. I don't. I uh, my metaphor is not a table. Uh, I feel like we're all living in this kind of illusionary bubble, and uh, I'm trying to find the pen that'll bust the bubble. Uh, so uh, it's, 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 not, it's not really a negotiation like one would imagine happens all, uh, across a table uh, and, or the table is where it's at. And you, if you don't have a seat at that table, then um, you're not effective, you're not, you're not a part of some kind of uh, critical issue. 
uh, I think this whole thing is a critical issue and um, it is, it, uh, what we're living is I believe a delusion. Uh, some of the Eastern philosophers said, you know, you're living in this kind of dream, this kind of fantasy. And I, I believe that's true. Uh, so um, my metaphor is uh, how do I, how do I push the right button? How do I prick the right uh, surface? How do I address uh, this uh, kind of imaginary place that I don't understand why people can't see it? So I'm kind of going, oh, whoa, anyone, anyone, anyone get this? This is, isn't this kind of bizarre? I mean, does it have to be like this? Um, and I would like to think that what I do, getting back to the art, is aesthetically enough of a hook that I could maybe hook people in because of the way I do something, uh, hook them in to the degree that they would go, well, wait a minute, that's not, that's an interesting thing he's talking about. Not only how he talks about it, but what he's talking about. Uh, and it's not a table, it's a big bubble. Chris, one more, one more. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. That's, so the Cam Camlin had that question. Maybe uh, mm -hmm. yep. something has to be to the students. Looking for that one there. <clears throat> um, so Cynthia is uh, asking, uh, she says, knowledge, it was interesting to hear you talk about the expectation of black artists to be political and that an earlier generation of black artists made it possible so that you don't have to be. As a white artist, I feel it's so easy for white artists to avoid dealing with whiteness. That is our privilege. Do you think it's different for white artists? I don't know. I never walked in the shoes of a, a white artist. I mean, I would imagine there's differences just because of the way in which uh, this whole um, game is structured, you know, and has been for some time. But listen, I encourage all artists, black, white, and other, you know, any, you know, other artists um, to just be authentic, you know, to find that righteousness that exists within them, tap into that and never let it go. You know what I mean? Like for me, that's the solution, you know, for many of the world's problems, you know, because righteousness is not something that um, uh, unique to any one particular group of people is something that we can all tap into, you know, when we find that best part of ourselves and kind of, you know, allow that to be our North Star, you know, so that's what I would tell any artist, you know, white or any other artist um, to just tap into and have the conversation. Don't, don't come out here and start having these contrived conversations because that doesn't um, serve you know, uh, the situation any better than having no conversation at all about certain things, you know, like speak your truth, you know what I'm saying? Whatever it is that actually resonating with you at that time, find your voice, find the courage to express yourself and, uh, and just take it from there. But tap into your righteousness, man. And, and, and it, excuse me, woman and man and all of us, we need to tap into that righteous element that exists within all of us and allow that to be our North Star, that which guides us and directs us. Uh, you yeah. want me to jump on that one or you want to go yeah. on? To something? Well, I, I think um, obviously I don't know about white artists or white people because I've never been that one, you know, but I suspect that um, all of us are subjected to uh, some things that we really need to look at. And I would suspect that I would suggest that white people start to look at their assumptions. Um, there's a whole bunch of people and a whole um, structure erected to guide your thinking about any number of things. And uh, you've gotta be conscious 
of who's talking to you and why are they saying uh, what they're saying to you. One of the things I learned from the arts is that um, you cannot, if you're an artist, or maybe anybody that makes a statement, whether it's visual language or music or conversation, um, you cannot not be in the statement that you make. I cannot not be in the work I make. I cannot. Even if I'm trying not to be there, uh, I'm still, if, if you have a good eye, you will see me trying not to be a part of the work I do. I'm very conscious of people making statements and uh, you can go with the statement or there's a subtext under there that uh, reveals where they're coming from. I love watching television and watching commercials because the intent and the, the um, um, the intent and actually the mentality of the person paying for that uh, advertisement is going to show. And what they're trying to get you to do. We live in a society that is, has to do with uh, consumers and um, institutions that sell and ideas and ideologies that are being sold to us. If you are not conscious, you will be any number of people that don't have anything to do with you. So I think for everybody, and I would uh, go follow what Knowledge was saying for white people, uh, you need to be conscious of, of, of the conversation that's being shoved in your head without you knowing that. And who are you and where are you coming from in relationship to critical issues? I think that's what this is all about, becoming, and we could have a long conversation about consciousness, but I think underneath racism, sexism, um, and homophobia is a kind of terrifying, uh, a, terror, a terror that has to do with the kind of consciousness that people exhibit and they, um, they play out without even knowing where they're coming from. All they know is that scares me and I need to react in the traditional ways I'm supposed to react to that. So I think it's being aware and it's being conscious and it's doing a critique on yourself that might be the road that we need to be going on. And I would recommend, because I'm a black man living here, I'd recommend that for everybody, but particularly white folks. Uh, I see there's a question here that uh, is for knowledge. Um, a, a, a different question from uh, Liz Aspill. What was it like getting to show your work in the show at uh, Black AF? How did you, how did that opportunity arise? Did it significantly change your career? How does it feel to have your art show cased in a popular show like that? Um, I mean, first of all, of course, it was an amazing opportunity that I'll be forever grateful and thankful for. Um, so Kenya Bars, who is the uh, creator of that television show, along with so many others and other movies that's happening nowadays, um, he get, he's a he's a longtime collector of my work. Um, I met him once I moved here to LA, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe five years ago, and uh, or a little, little, little longer. Um, the, the scene that was portrayed within that a particular episode was something that was very close to the actual uh, 
situation surrounding him investing in my black paintings. Um, basically, I sent him a video of uh, my, my latest exhibition at the time. It looked totally different than anything he's ever saw me create. He called me up, hey, what the hell is this? You know, I explained it to him. And after explaining it to him, because you can't really get a gist of those black paintings through photography or even motion picture, you really need to stand in front of them. Um, and that was something that I was uh, reminded of when studying the works of, of uh, Ad Reinhardt. He talked about that. You know, he wanted to, he purposely wanted to create something that couldn't be photographed or represented in some sort of uh, uh, reproduction fashion. So anyway, Kenya reached out to me. I mean, I reached out to him. I showed him the work. We had this conversation. And he said to me, listen, please, can I write this into an episode of my television show, which is going to be coming out soon? You know, I didn't think much of it. I didn't necessarily think it would actually happen. Um, I said, of course, we could do it. You know, I, I, I try to say yes quite often to opportunities because I feel as though there's a responsibility that comes along with even being given opportunities, you know? So for me to be able to represent not only for myself, but other artists as well. So we do the show, I was scared to, you know, I'm not an actor, <laughs> you know, I've never been in front of a camera in such a way. And I knew this was going out to 190 countries worldwide and uh, through, the, through the Netflix platform. So, you know, uh, we, we did it, the show launched, and of course, it has had a very uh, positive impact on my career um, from a standpoint of exposure, right? Many, actually, this is the way in which the university, Kane University, uh, the woman there who pretty much put together the exhibition, this was the way in which she discovered my work, you know, and just happened to find out that I was from New Jersey. Uh, I don't have to mention New York. I grew up in both places, but I'm also, I'm from New Jersey. Um, so she, they learned about it because of that television show. So there's been many opportunities that's come to me um, since then for things that we're planning well out, you know, for the next five years um, with this television show. And for me, it's something that I have to uh, take a moment to reflect in a lot because I'm, I'm, you know, I can sometimes be very active and not necessarily um, stop to, as they say, smell of roses, or, you know, sometimes I have to pinch myself to remind myself that it's real and that I'm a part of this history that has taken place on television where generations to come will be watching these episodes and there I'll be, you know, episode three. So, uh, so it's, it, it's definitely was something that I'm very thankful for, grateful for, and yes, it has had a very positive impact on my career thus far, and I'm looking to take it to the next level, you know. I think we should wind up. Uh, Ed, do you have any last comments? Uh, no, I, you know, not without talking for the next day or so. Um, <laughs> I pretty much uh, I, I feel okay. I, I, I do want to thank you for um, uh, allowing us and steering us to talk about art a little bit uh, more than uh, the interviews I've dealt with before. Um, and uh, it's uh, the art as it relates to um, some of the conceptual and ideological places that we go. Um, thank you for that. And this was more, uh, well, let me put it this way. Oftentimes I end up having to tell stories about my personal life and, you know, who do I like and who do I don't like and what color is my bedspread and uh, stuff like that. Um, this has been, uh, you know, delightfully down another trail and I, I thank you for that. Thank you, and and uh, it has knowledge. something. To, I, think you wanna... I think it. I think it has something to do with Iceland or something. I don't know. <laughs> Nalis, do you want to add anything to to our almost to our conversation? Yeah, I mean, I just want to thank everybody who tuned in tonight. Always appreciative for people. Like I said, this is a dialogue, not a monologue. So. Um, appreciative to those who came in, listened, and, and contributed with their questions. Um, also, 
I would like to thank Western Washington University for giving me not only this opportunity, but also the opportunity to exhibit there, even though the exhibition was short lived because of all the other uh, surrounding circumstances. But nonetheless, it was a it was a great experience for me. It was great to see my work at that uh, university, and, I, and and hopefully that's something that has spawned <clears throat> many other engagements with other you know uh, institutions, of academia. Um, so, and I'm sure one day somehow we will revisit, you know, another opportunity to come back and exhibit with the, with the university, you know, everybody there treated me really well. And I did get a lot of feedback from the students who, who did have the opportunity to go to the show that many of them reached out to me through, uh, social media and we exchanged, you know, through, uh, we had a dialogue through the, you know, the Instagram platform. And, um, so the show wasn't. I don't see it as a failure, you know, or a lost opportunity. I just, you know, it did what it was supposed to do. And when it's time to do more, we'll do it again. Uh, uh, I'd also like to thank Knowledge for both his uh, candid uh, statements, where he's coming from and um, his insights. Thank you, brother. That was, it, it, you have made this uh, a really nice um, occasion for me. Good luck. Uh, keep your back to the wall uh, and uh, don't take no for an answer, man. I appreciate that, Eric. This is the, uh, well, now third time that we've conversed. And uh, every time I listen to you, I learn something, you know, and, and one of my models in life is always remain teachable. So I appreciate you for sure, you know, and, 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 and all the things that you've done up until this point has made it possible for me to do what I'm doing. So, yeah, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Thank you both. I really, really appreciate uh, this conversation and uh, being able to uh, bring the two of you together. That's a privilege. Uh, what a lucky, lucky place Bellingham is to uh, to to have had these two exhibitions. I I, I enjoyed them. <laughs> I learned a lot from them, and uh, to be able to bring the two of you into this dialogue and uh, you know. Uh, here and you always go deeper than than uh, the question is much deeper so i appreciate that so and thank you all of, of our guests for coming uh it's nice to see you and uh, to do some more of this yes yeah thank, thank you peace everybody all right take care